Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just to get a couple of things out of the way, um, as usual, if you could please silence your cell phones uh, so we can avoid the interruptions. Um, another couple of things, we have two great events this week, one tomorrow uh, and one on Friday as well. So uh, for more information, you can grab some flyers on the way out from the table next to the door. Um, and then one last thing, um, as a nonprofit organization, we depend on the support of people like all of you here. Uh, so if you could please support us uh, however you can, whether it's by making a donation or by supporting us through uh, letting your friends and family know about us and our events, um, you can always watch online. Uh, so even if they're not here, they can always support us that way. And of course, donations are always good. Um, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to welcome you here, including everybody that's watching online on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Uh, it's also a great honor to introduce today our speakers, uh, Yusuf Al Jamal and Miko Pellet, who is no stranger here. Um, and uh, both of them will be giving a talk titled uh, Palestine in Crisis and it will focus on the detention of Palestinian children. Uh, Yusuf al-Jamal is on a speaking tour here in the U.S. Uh, to address the incarceration of Palestinian children, uh, many of whom languish in Israeli jails for years without any charge, and the situation of Gaza, which has endured uh, 13 years of continuous siege uh, and three extremely harsh wars. Uh, Yusuf is also joined by uh, the activist Miko Pellet in shedding light on this very serious subject. Uh, Yusuf uh, grew up in uh, Al Nusayrat uh, refugee camp in southern Gaza and he attended schools uh, run by UNRWA. Uh, he obtained his BA from the Islamic University of Gaza and his MA from a university in Malaysia. Uh, for several, uh, several years, he ran the Hashem Yop Sani Library. I hope I didn't butcher that name too much. Um, in Gaza Center for Political and Development Studies. And he's currently working on a PhD in international relations at Sikaria University in Turkey. Uh, his writings have been published in Mondo Weiss, Electronic Intifada, and the Palestinian, uh, Palestine Chronicle, excuse me. He was the translator into English of the recent book, uh, Dreaming of Freedom, Palestinian uh, Child Prisoners Speak, and it is right here. And we will, we will have uh, books available for purchase after the event. Uh, and he also contributed to the edi uh, edited anthology, Gaza Writes Back, short stories from young writers in Gaza. Uh, Miko Peled uh, is the author of The General's Son and Injustice, and was born in Jerusalem in 1961 into a well-known Zionist family. Uh, Miko is a writer and human rights activist born and raised in Jerusalem, and he's considered by many uh, to be one of the clearest voices calling for justice in Palestine. Uh, support of the Palestinian call for BDS and the creation of a single democracy with equal rights on all of historic Palestine. Uh, and if you're interested, he maintains a blog at mikopeled.com. Uh, one last thing, actually. Uh, so, as I said, Yusuf is on a speaking tour here and he is going to be in a rush to leave. So, um, when we get to the question, answer, uh, question and answer session, you could please keep your uh, questions brief and to the point so that we can have enough time. Uh, yeah, he has to catch a train, so. Um, and also, we ask that you wait for the mic to come to you uh, before you answer so everybody can hear online as well. Uh, and for the online audience, you can always tweet your questions to our account, which is at Palestine Center. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Yusuf and Miko. Okay, um, hello everyone, and thank you very much for showing up today. <laughs> much appreciated, the weather is lovely outside, and uh, I think uh, it's good to be here today uh, with Miko talking about 
Gaza and the issue of Palestinian child uh, prisoners. Uh, so I grew up in Gaza, uh, Nusayarat refugee camp, which is a home for 85,000 Palestinians. Uh, one of them is my friend Mohammed Al Hamami, who's here today. Uh, he's um, doing his masters at Georgetown. And the refugee camp is very crowded. And uh, it's not the most crowded refugee camp, of course. In Gaza, we have Jabalia refugee camp, where nearly uh, 90,000 Palestinians live in one square kilometer. We have eight refugee camps in, in Gaza. And I thought always that when the issue of Palestinians, uh, especially in Gaza and in the West Bank, is addressed, Palestinians are always reduced um, to statistics and numbers. And this hurted me a lot because I grew up in Gaza and I suffered personal loss and my family, just like any other Palestinian family, uh, was uh, uh, impacted by the occupation. And I thought to myself that is the best way, you know, to change this narrative of reducing Palestinians uh, into statistics and numbers is to narrate personal stories under occupation because people uh, relate to these uh, stories. So. One of these stories that I started uh, with was the story of my eldest brother, Omar, who in 2004 was shot dead by the Israeli army when they invaded Nusayarat refugee camp, uh, killing him and 13 other Palestinians. So this was a year before Israel decided to withdraw from the Gaza Strip, and they would invade various refugee camps, kill a number of Palestinians, demolish a house and leave. And uh, my brother was 17 years old. And when I rushed to the site of his uh, killing the following day, I found some of his belongings on the ground, including his phone. So I tried to see the numbers he was trying to dial as he was pleading uh, next to his friend, Khalid. And I found that he was trying to reach out to the family, you know, to speak maybe, to say uh, a few words. Um, while, he was while he was bleeding. And part of this, you know, narrative of, he, of who he was and his life, uh, I wrote uh, an article titled, Why I Have Two Brothers Named Omar. So, you know, Palestinian families are big and extended. So I have uh, seven sisters and five brothers. And two years after my brother's uh, killing, my mother delivered another baby boy and she named him after my eldest brother. So I ended up with two brothers named Omar. This is Omar, the youngest. He's a naughty, be naughty boy, he's 13. <laughs> and I wrote about the experience of killing my eldest brother and the, you know, who, who used to, to take care of me when I was young and at the same time, how it would be for my youngest brother, you know, to, to live a life where he is named after his eldest brother who was killed by Israel in a collection of short stories that Helena published in 2014 called Gaza Writes Back, and the story uh, was called Omar X. Um, so this was one of the stories that I documented. Uh, in 1948, half of my family ended up in the West Bank, the other half ended up in Gaza. And my brother, mother's part of the family ended up in, in the West Bank. My mother grew up in Beit Sahur, in Beit Lahim. And my father grew up in Gaza, and this is where I grew up. So in order to visit m her own family, my mother had to wait 12 years for Israel to grant her a permit to see her family, which lives an hour away from our refugee camp in Gaza. And meanwhile, in 2003, 2008, her parents passed away and she was not able to join the funeral procession. So after I wrote about uh, her experience, uh, you know, not being able to see her family, again, my mother is not the only one. This is the story of every single Palestinian. Uh, some journalists tried to interview her and there was some media uproar about her story. And finally, an Israeli human rights organization called Gisha helped her get a four-day permit to see her family for the first time in 12 years. Of course, she stayed 32 days a day for every year she spent in Gaza. She was 
uh, considered illegal, like staying, overstaying in her uh, own home uh, town because she changed her ID to Gaza. So if you have a Gaza ID, you have to have a permit to get to the West Bank, and there are different sets and rules of, of IDs and passports, travel documents. If you, are, if you are a Palestinian living in Jerusalem, you have uh, uh, different uh, uh, struggles getting in and out and permits. So Palestinians are defined by the travel document or ID they have. I have the Gaza ID, my West Bank family has the West Bank uh, ID, and then Jerusalem and 1948. Uh, Palestine, they, have, they are third class Israeli citizens. Uh, again, the issue of travel restrictions is not limited to the Rafah cross, to, to, to the Eris crossing that connects Gaza with uh, 1948 Palestine, but it also uh, affects Palestinians who try to get out of Gaza through Egypt. So uh, it took me two months in 2013 trying to get out of Gaza. Uh, through Egypt, and the journey takes two to three days. It's usually, it should take six hours, but because of checkpoints and waiting and uh, having to wait the deportation bus where we are not allowed to travel by ourselves, where our passports are held by the uh, Egyptian security until we make it to Cairo airport, it takes two to three days. And going back to Gaza is the same uh, story. My mother got another travel permit in 2015 because her eldest brother passed away in the West Bank. So when there is a death in the family, first degree death, they might give permits uh, to Palestinians from Gaza and West Bank to see each other. This year she got two permits because, because she got uh, breast cancer and the only hospital that treats Palestinians uh, from Gaza and the West Bank is located in Jerusalem. It's called Augusta Victoria Hospital. And she was lucky enough to get the permit because there are dozens of patients who passed away waiting for Israeli permits um, to just to see, receive medical treatment. Uh, and speaking of patients who passed away, in 2007, my eldest sister, she was 26 years old, newly married by then, an UNRWA teacher, she needed a minor surgery, which was not available in Gaza due to the siege. She applied for an Israeli permit, and after waiting a week, her health deteriorated. The Israelis decided not to give her uh, a permit to have this surgery in Jerusalem. And as a result, uh, her health uh, deteriorated, and she waited one more week to get out of Gaza to the Rafah crossing because it was shut down. The Rafah crossing is the crossing that connects Gaza with Egypt. So when she managed to leave Gaza, it was too late. She had the surgery in Cairo, but two days later, she passed away. So I documented her story. Uh, in 2014, as you know, Israel killed 2,200 Palestinians. One of them was my childhood friend, Ayman Shukur. He was just standing on the roof of their building in Nusayrat refugee camp when Israel was randomly shilling the area. Uh, and I was in Jordan at the time to see my West Bank family because I cannot travel uh, to the West Bank myself. Uh, I had to travel to Jordan to see my West, West Bank family after nearly 15 years of not seeing them. And at the time he was killed and I received the news when I was in Jordan, so I documented his story. Again, what happened with my youngest brother Omar happened with uh, Ayman where his uh, younger brother was married and uh, he named his uh, son again after his eldest brother, Ayman. So why I document these uh, stories uh, and personal narratives? Uh, I do so because I think they are important, and it's not only the stories of my family, which I said uh, are not unique. They are the story of every, every single Palestinian family but because personal narratives uh, matter. And an aspect of military occupation in the West Bank is the issue of child prisoners. So I was involved in a project to produce a book, basically personal testimonies and interviews of child prisoners of Palestinians who were detained by Israel. Um, we have 29 stories uh, of Palestinians who were detained by Israel, child prisoners. And to give you a background, into this issue. Israel is the only country in the world that 
systematically prosecutes children before military courts and it discriminates against Palestinian children and Israeli children when it comes to age considerations where Palestinian children are considered those under the age of 18 while Israeli children are considered those under the age of 16. The other way around? Okay, so yeah, Palestinian children are those under the age of 16 and Israeli children are the, under the age of 18 uh, because this makes it easier for Israel to treat minors as adults and therefore to give them tougher sentences. As we will see what happened, for example, with the uh, child Ahmad Manasra, is the Israeli court waited until he turned 16 so that they could uh, give him a very harsh sentence. I think he was sentenced to 15 years in jail. Um, again, these children are snatched from their families, kidnapped in the middle of the night. Israel can send summons to these children and their families to come the next day, but they do this on purpose mm -hmm. to terrify these children and their families. Uh, they take them to interrogation centers uh, where they are very often uh, physically assaulted and eventually asked or forced to uh, sign confessions in a language they do not understand, Hebrew. Um, some of these children uh, spend a few months in Israeli jail. Some of them spend a few years, uh, as I mentioned, Ahmed Manasra and the five Harris boys, which I mentioned uh, shortly. They were sentenced to 15 years in jail. Uh, what struck me the most about all these children, whether they spend few months or few years in Israeli jails that this experience changes them for forever. So the book is dedicated to child Ayman Abbasi from Jerusalem, who upon his release from Israeli jails was shot dead while participating in a peaceful demonstration in Jerusalem in 2015. We interviewed the child, but when we were trying to look for a photo to use in the book, I found out that he was shot dead. So the book is dedicated for him because he was interviewed for the book, uh, but he did not live long enough to see it published. And this shows the importance of documenting these stories because the story of Ayman would have gone otherwise uh, undocumented uh, because of his killing. Uh, this is his story. So we have personal testimonies of every single child in the book. Uh, I will not go through this because of time uh, restrictions. Malak al-Khatib, I think many of you are familiar with her. She was uh, 14 years old, going back from school to her family's house when um, she liked some flowers in one of the fields. And she wanted to pick them up. And then she was arrested by the Israeli army, accusing her of accessing a restricted area, a military zone. And she spent a few months in, in Israeli jails. Uh, the final story is the story of Yazan Sharbati. Uh, those who are familiar with Hebron, uh, Yazan lives at uh, Shohada Street, Martha's Street, which is a segregated street where Israeli settlers have their own, dozens of Israeli settlers have their own uh, part of the road, and Palestinians, thousands of Palestinians who live there have their own uh, part of the road. and. When Yazan was walking uh, near his family's house, he was assaulted by Israeli settlers. And instead of arresting these settlers who assaulted him, he was arrested and taken for interrogation. And again, I was looking for a photo to, to use in this presentation for Yazan, and I found out that he was re-arrested again in 2017, and this is a photo of him at the time. Um, so the story of the five Harris uh, boys. Uh, Harris is a West Bank village, and there was a car accident which resulted in the serious injury of some Israeli settlers. So the uh, driver of the truck uh, gave a testimony once the uh, car accident took place, but he changed his mind afterwards. At the beginning, initially he said, the car accident uh, was caused by uh, a flat uh, tire. And then he changed his mind. He said, no, uh, some Palestinian children threw stones uh, at me, which uh, caused the, the uh, car accident. This was not 
uh, approved by any independent uh, witnesses and the Israeli court of course took this narrative and sentenced five children from the Harris village in the West Bank to 15 years in jail. So to conclude, uh, you know, documenting these stories is important because we want to see change. And speaking of the U.S. and the military aid that the U.S. gives to Israel annually uh, from the tax money of U.S. citizens, part of this money is used to detain and arrest Palestinian children. And currently there is a bill in the House of Representatives uh, introduced by Representative Betty McCollum which calls for making sure that U.S. aid given to other governments all over the world, including Israel, is not used to torture or detain children, including Palestinian children. And I think as U.S. citizens, the best way to approach this issue is to bring about change in the lives of these children and their families, and this is done through pressuring Congress people uh, and getting them to sign the bill to make sure that U.S. money is not used uh, to torture and detain Palestinian children. I will stop here, and then maybe if you have questions, uh, and Miko will continue the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. It's nice to be here at the Palestine Center again, uh, this time with Yusuf. And um, um, Yusuf and I met uh, a few years ago in Gaza. And the only way, of course, I cannot go to Gaza, um, but I got a message one day um, on Facebook asking me if I'm interested to visit Gaza, and I said yes. And then, and then they asked, uh, would I be willing to um, would I be willing to go in through the subway? <laughs> and so it took me a minute or two to figure out what they were saying. But then, of course, I said yes, and uh, I wasn't going to uh, turn down such gracious hospitality from friends in Gaza. And so that was the first time Yusuf and I met. He organized a great uh, few days for me um, visit in, in the Gaza Strip. And then uh, we traveled together and spoke in Malaysia and in New Zealand and met here in the U.S. And it's interesting because, the, you know, he, he mentioned the IDs. You know, I'm an Israeli Jew with an Israeli citizenship. He's a Palestinian with a Gaza ID. So the only place in the world that we cannot meet legally is in Palestine. We can meet all over the world, but the only way for us to meet in Palestine is either I have to break the law or he has to break the law. It's easier for me to break the law because being coming from the privileged side of an apartheid regime, I have very little to risk. Uh, whereas if he was caught, he would be spending years and years in jail. So that is the reality. And of course, part of the tragedy is that if we talk about this reality, we are accused of hate speech and anti-Semitism. And um, <clears throat> I was just, I just came back from two weeks in Europe and part of my trip was in the UK, um, which maybe isn't quite Europe anymore, we'll see. But anyway, the um, two of the three places where I spoke were churches and there was a demand by Zionist groups of the churches to issue an apology for having hosted me because my speech contains anti-Semitism. And the Church of England dutifully apologized. So then they went to the second church and said, well, they apologized, now you have to apologize. And they did the same. Um, because we don't want to upset the Zionists, God forbid. They're very fragile, very brittle, and we don't want to offend them. <laughs> so speaking about uh, pointing out that the Zionists support an apartheid regime where different parts of the population are governed by different laws and are given different ID is the anti-Semitism, that is the racism. The problem is not the racism that they actually practice um, under, under the Israeli, under the Israeli uh, control. And that is a very sad state of affairs. Of course, here in the US, this is not news, we know this. Pointing out their crimes is the anti-Semitism and the racism, not their practices. 
And that's something that I think we have to overcome. I mean, that's the biggest challenge for us. Um, and then, you know, the, the looking into the actual specifics of these different categories in which Palestinians live, it's incredible just how complicated and sophisticated it is because like you heard, Ga he's got a Gaza ID, his family in this area that by the way, used to be the West Bank, th there's no West Bank, it's just really a, f a phrase. The West Bank today is Judea and Samaria. It's a completely integrated with the state of Israel, except for, except for pockets in which, or I would say ghettos or banjistans in which they have what they refer to as a problematic population. And that's what exists there today. Um, when we say West Bank, we mean the Palestinians who live under military rule in that part of the country. Uh, but anyway, they have their own ID. The Jerusalemites have their own ID. And by the way, I'm from Jerusalem and I have a regular Israeli citizenship. I have no limitations. I can come and go as I please. I've been gone for you know many, many years. I can go back tomorrow. If I was Palestinian, I would, having been gone for several years, I would be at that that status would have been taken away and I could only go back as a tourist. Um, and of course, Palestinian families have been in Jerusalem for a thousand years. My family's been in Jerusalem less than a hundred years. But that's kind of the reality. So that's Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza. We have uh, the citizens of, or the so-called citizens of the state of Israel um, who have this quasi-Israeli citizenship. It's not the same citizenship, not the same rights and privileges that I have, that's for sure. And then you've got the Palestinians in refugee camps, millions of Palestinians on the outside who have no rights to come back because Israel won't allow them to come back and they're stuck in living in these horrible camps in terrible poverty. Um, but to mention that this is an apartheid regime is a problem. So we have to be careful how we say so that the Zionists are not offended and call us anti-Semitic. Um, but of course, it's, 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 a, it's a very poor joke. We must step, state that this is uh, an apartheid regime, and we must state that an apartheid is also a crime, is defined as a crime against humanity. And Israel has been engaged in this crime, not for a decade, not for two decades, not for five decades, from, but for over seven decades since Israel was established, it has been an apartheid regime. Um, another thing that Yusuf mentioned was the, um, the different types of ways that people, even in his family, have been killed. He has a brother that was killed in action, in battle, by Israeli soldiers. He has a sister who was killed because she couldn't get medical care. And we know that Israel bombs Gaza. And it's interesting because when people talk about the Israeli bombing of Gaza, they usually talk about only within the last you know, decade. But Israel bombing and Israeli attack, military attacks against Gaza have been going back seven decades. As soon as the, Israel established the, or created the Gaza Strip, they began attacking the Gaza Strip, saying that there's a threat from these poor homeless refugees to the state that was just created with a massive army. Um, so today they say the problem is Hamas, before that they say the problem was called something else, and before that the problem was called something else. But somehow these poor homeless refugees that have been thrown into Gaza, into the Gaza Strip by Israel, are always somehow presenting a threat. So they die by death, of, by, 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 you know, by military, by killing. They die because of lack of access to proper medical care because Israel decides who gets the medical care and who doesn't. Um, from Gaza to perfectly good medical um, uh, healthcare institutions within, you know, you could be there w w just within a short drive. There's no reason in the world why he, his sister would need to go all the way to Cairo and then all the way to God knows where else where they could drive 20 minutes or half an hour and be at a perfectly, uh, perfectly good medical facility. But Israel does not allow, or Israel decides who gets and who does not get to use the medical facilities. Um, and then there's the issue of water. 2.2 million people in, this, in the Gaza Strip, which is really a massive concentration camp, have no access to clean water. And sure enough, we know that if, we're, if, you'd wanna, if you wanna kill somebody but save the money on a bullet, denying them water is a sure way to kill them. So this is all going on as we sit here today and talk, as we sit here today in DC and, 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 and talk about this issue. But the one thing we're not allowed to say is that Israel is engaged in genocide because that's anti-Semitic. So Israel having all these different ways of murdering Palestinians and doing it for decades, countless and countless and countless, numbers that are beyond counting, 
uh, is not the problem. The problem is that we dare to point out that it's genocide. And genocide is a very serious accusation. I don't take it lightly. So if you have any doubt whether or not Israel has been engaged in genocide, look up the definition of the crime of genocide. And you will see and compare that to what Israel has been doing for seven decades and see for yourself. And of course we have, so we have the apartheid regime, we have the genocide, and why is Yusuf's family in the Gaza Strip? Why are they there? They're not from there. Because there has also been a process of ethnic cleansing going on for seven decades. It began shortly, well actually it began way before 1948, but it's been going on for close to a century. This massive campaign of ethnic cleansing, which is also a crime against humanity, and also pointing that out is anti-Semitic. So there's nothing you could possibly say about Palestine, about the reality in Palestine without being accused as being anti-Semitic. And people ask me this lately, more than before, is there any way to talk about the issue of Palestine and not be called anti-Semitic? And the answer is no, there isn't. I think it was um, uh, Robert Fisk, I think, who said that being called anti-Semitic is a small price to pay to stand up and speak up for Palestine. But um, the thing is, if, if pointing out racism is racism, that's absurd. Um, so there's nothing anti-Semitic, of course, because, of course, this has nothing to do with Jews. The fact that the Zionists happen to be Jews does not reflect on all Jewish people. And Jewish people have been opposing, to Zi opposing Zionism for, from the very, very beginning. But I think it's something, it's, this, is, this is the tough battle that we all have to be part of, because if we're going to um, stay silent, nothing will happen. If we're willing to step up, we have to be willing to take the heat, and being called anti-Semitic is one of those things that uh, obviously, this is their, this is their new weapon. You know, this is not new, but this is the weapon that they, I think they find as, the, as being the most uh, effective, is calling people anti-Semitic. But I think it's very cr important that we all point out that genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid, which are crimes against humanity, are being perpetrated against the Palestinian people, and have been doing so for seven decades, and are doing it on our dime because $3.8 billion of our taxpayer money, and that's just the foreign aid part, goes to that. Goes directly to, these, to, to perpetuating these three crimes against the people of Palestine. So standing up with you know, Free Palestine uh, posters is not good enough anymore. We need to really act and we need to engage. And the issue of, the issue that, uh, again, that, uh, that uh, Yosef was talking about of the child prisoners, you would think, you would think that this is an issue that everybody can rally around because what's, what's, what could possibly be the upside of supporting the torture and detention of children? What's the upside? I mean, what's good about it? Is there any benefit? Is there any security benefit to it whatsoever? Is there any benefit? There isn't, of course. But I was notified, I was told by uh, Congressman Andy Levin that none of the Jewish members of Congress will support this bill, Betty McCollum's bill, because they don't want to be tagged as pro-Palestinian. What kind of a mad reality is this, that people are afraid to support a bill that is designed to ensure that children are not hurt, that ch children are not tortured and detained? And many times, the only reason these kids are being detained, and, and Yusuf pointed that out, is to either get them to confess to something they didn't do or to get them to point a finger at somebody else and then they can come back and arrest. And I have friends, adults, who were arrested and spent years in prison because the authorities said, well, we have a secret witness. Well, the secret witness happened to be, happens to be a 10-year-old kid who spent a few days in a, in a cold prison cell being yelled at and, and abused by, by Israeli guard, by Israeli secret police. That should be enough for a kid to, to point out, to point to anybody and accuse anybody of anything. And that's exactly what it's about. So it's a very sad state of affairs that this is, this is even, uh, that this is something that people uh, are afraid to support and are not supporting. And like Yusuf said, it's up to us. If we don't make sure that our elected officials know that we demand this, they will never do this. You know, and it's true here and it's true in Europe too. You talk, you, you know, I speak, I spoke in front of thousands of people and they all are completely on, on board with supporting Palestine, but never reaches the politicians. And somehow there's this gap between the voters and the, the people to whom they, for whom they vote. And these are all Western democracies, so people vote, people have a say. 
in who their representatives and who the governments are going to be. So there's no excuse for us. We need to do more of what we're doing. And thankfully, the Palestinians have given us a pathway. Palestinians have given us a gift telling us exactly what we can do and what we should do in order to uh, change things, and that's the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. This was a gift the Palestinians gave us, and I don't think people are appreciating what an enormous gift this was. This is telling us exactly what we need to do. It has a track record. It's, it's, it's dedicated. It's intelligent. It works. Uh, it's morally the right thing to do. What could be, what could be, you know, what could be more, more uh, morally correct to do than to impose boycott, divestment, and sanctions against a state that has been engaged in, in massive hu crimes against humanity for seven decades? Genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid. And people still argue whether it's anti-Semitic, it's not anti-Semitic. It's uh, the, the claim that BDS is somehow anti-Semitic is, is, is absurd. The demands of BDS, ending the military occupation where it still exists, these pockets of problematic populations that have to be controlled by the military, allowing the refugees to return to their homes and their land so, uh, so, so, so people like Yusuf and his family can go back to their, where, they, where they belong, which is not within the prisons of the Gaza Strip, within the, uh, the prison, and equal rights. So we have the same rights uh, in this country that we both happen to be born in. What could be more reasonable than that? What could be more m simple and, 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 and remedial than that? It's about remedy, it's about providing a remedy to the conditions into which Palestinians have been placed as a result of the establishment of the State of Israel. You've got Palestinians who are refugees, you've got Palestinians living under military, a military regime, and you've got Palestinians who are living under an apartheid regime. You take care of the equality, you take care, you allow the refugees to return, you end the military rule, and you have a country where people can actually live, Israelis and Palestinians. So granted, Israelis like myself, we're like the whites in South Africa, we're these, you know, the result of settler colonialism, but we're st now there's this new thing called Israelis. You know, we're not indigenous, but we're now there. So the idea that only one side can have rights is a, is a Zionist idea. Because if he had rights, that would somehow infringe on my life. Why? You know, it's a very racist idea that only one side, one side can have rights or the other side can have rights, but we can't all live in peace together. And that's because one side, which is my side, does not want to give up the privilege. So that is exactly, going back to BDS, that is exactly the cure. That is exactly uh, what the doctor orders, and that's exactly what Palestinians have asked us to do. So again, we have to fight this fight where people call us anti-Semitic, but again, it's a small price to pay, and it's very easy to respond. In other words, this is anti-Semitic? Creating a reality where people don't have access to medical care because they're Palestinians and they live in a ghetto or in a concentration camp, that's not racist? Randomly bombing the Gaza Strip for, for decades is not racist? Denying people water? The apartheid regime? The ethnic cleansing? That, all that is not racist? Calling it is racist? So the argument against the call for the, the, these claims of anti-Semitism are really quite, um, quite simple and quite easy, and we, it's important that we engage. Rather than be afraid to be called anti-Semitic, anti which is again a false claim, I would, I would encourage everyone to, uh, to actually stand up and, 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 argue, and argue it. Um, at the end of the day, I think what is crucial, and I say this knowing that I think a week from now, the J Street Conference is about to start here in, in DC. Um, it's, it's very important that people who support justice, people who believe in equality, people who believe in human rights, um, engage on the issue of Palestine. I think that's the issue, that's the one issue that we're all going to be judged upon. This is the issue that's going to define us all. Um, and I think a good place to start is by calling the country Palestine again. It's not Israel-Palestine. Israel is a regime that has been engaged in three massive crimes against humanity. Calling the country Israel is legitimizing these crimes because there is no other Israel. It's not like there's a, a, an Israeli regime that could be nice and then there's an Israeli regime that is not nice. This is the only way there could be an Israel. Israel has shown very clearly. It has always been engaged and it's, all, its entire existence is engaging in these terrible crimes against the Palestinians. So if we want to legitimize those crimes, by all means, call that country 
call that country Israel, and then, you know, the people who do so will be remembered like the people who called Nelson Mandela a terrorist and voted against boycotting South Africa. But I think people of conscience need to remember to call this country by its name, which is Palestine. And that is, that is in the end of itself, is, is, is already a, a step in the right direction. And then not to be afraid to stand up and speak up, not to be afraid to visit, not to be afraid to answer back, and to point out when people do uh, talk about two states, they talk about the two-state solution, they talk about the rights of, of, uh, of Jewish people to a homeland in, in, in Palestine and all this, none, none of this is relevant anymore. Today there's a reality and that reality should not be tolerated and should not be allowed to continue and it's up to us to make a difference. And I truly believe that if we all do our part and if we all do work as hard as we can, then Palestine, a free Palestine, a democratic Palestine, a Palestine that Yusuf and I can live together in peace as equals, although he probably has more rights than I do, but regardless, uh, it can be a reality and it can be a reality soon, it can be a reality that we can all uh, live to see, but we're going to have to work very hard. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, how is uh, the election of representatives uh, Ilhan Omar and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Klein to the Congress and uh, uh, actions like those of Betty McCullum changing the uh, uh, discourse on Palestine and the U.S. And if I could also ask, uh, how long uh, does uh, a Palestinian have to be outside Israel before he can be refused uh, re-entry or into Palestine? re-entry, uh, and uh, what is the justification that uh, the Israeli government gives for this? Uh, so there's, hold on, so the, the first question was the, the, the election of Ilhan Omar Rashid and, and um, well, I'll, I'll take it. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's changed the discourse, do I need this? I think there's no question that their election has, um, that their election has changed the discourse in this country completely in, in a very good way. I think 10 years ago, um, nobody would have imagined that it would have reached the levels that it has today where you actually had a congressional delegation led by Ilhan Omar that was refused entry to Israel. I think if you said that to somebody 10 years ago, they'd laugh. A congressional delegation being refused entry to Israel because Israel doesn't like the way they look and maybe their politics, it's absurd. And I think it's a good thing. In other words, I think this issue has not been polarized enough uh, in American politics. Uh, there's this uh, sense that you know it's, bi it's bipartisan, Republicans, Democrats all support Israel, and so on and so forth. I think that what they did is they showed that you can't be both. You can't support racism and say that you're against racism. So if you support Israel, you're supporting racism. You have to own it. Um, and, and, and I think thanks to them, uh, this is now, and of course, Trump called everybody, uh, is calling everybody anti-Semitic as well and called them anti-Semitic and called the entire Democratic Party anti-Semitic. So it's bringing it to all these absurd levels, which is very, very good, I think. Um, and then your second question about how long does it take before they can refuse somebody? Well, refuse somebody. well I think the, 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 the one, the, what I know is the, is the people with Jerusalem ID, and I don't know because these things change. It used to be six years, then it became three years, I, knew d I do know that if they receive, a, if they have a second passport, then their Jerusalem ID is taken away, and they can't come back. But how long, how long they have to be gone before that happens, I don't know, because this, th these things change all the time. And the justification? There is no justification. They don't need to justify anything they do. It's not encoded in Israeli law. Well, Nothing that I know of, no. no. Okay. Uh, I think uh, having discussions on Palestine the way it is uh, today in the United States, especially at the House of Representatives, is something that we uh, never had before. And speaking of child prisoners uh, and the reaction the bill received in Palestine, and I have some of these uh, families and children uh, on my social media accounts, uh, 
Palestinians never expected that something like this would ever happen in the United States. So we see change, it's not enough, but it's happening and it will take time. I think the battle is long, and, but you know what we should continue doing is continue you know, the, the fight uh, because eventually uh, a change will happen and uh, we will see that you know, Palestine is legitimized as a discourse in the US political circles as it is on the grassroots level. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, Jerusalem, I think three to five years, I'm not sure, it's either three to or f five years if Palestinians leave uh, without returning, they revoke their uh, IDs. Thank you. My name is Saeed uh, Arika. I'm a journalist. I have a very quick question uh, for you, Yusuf. Actually, a follow-up on this question. In your case, you know, you can you go back really to Gaza? You know, now how, I don't know how long you've been out of Gaza. Can you go back uh, really? And then I have a, a question for Miko. But tell us what happened in your case. Okay, uh, so I haven't been back. Today is the 21st of October. So exactly three years ago, I left Gaza and uh, I never returned back. And at the, end, at, at the beginning of this year, I had to bring my parents to Turkey to see them uh, because uh, I wouldn't take the risk of going back to Gaza. Uh, so recently, the Rafah crossing has been open, but they allow a, number, a limited number of Palestinians to get in and out every, every day. But still, it's open. Practically, I can return back, but uh, there is no guarantee that I will get out again. Or I might be able to get out, but it will take me too much time that I will lose my studies and PhD. So there is a queue. Thousands of people are registered to travel. And they allow 100 and 150 people every day to get out. So in order to wait for my turn to get out, I think I will wait for months and maybe years. And the other way is to pay you know, a bribe, which is unethical. I wouldn't do that. And going back through Israel is also 99% is impossible. So practically, I can go back. And the journey is very long. As I said, it takes three days in the Sinai, dozens of checkpoints, and uh, it's, a, it's a form of torture, another form of torture that we go through. Going back, like my parents, it took them four days to get into Gaza when they returned back from Turkey. Which is a three-hour flight. Yeah. And usually it's a six hour drive from Cairo to Gaza. Uh, I did this drive back in the days when things were all right, but now it's a form of torture. And getting out of Gaza is, is the same. But also I have to wait first for the queue, for my turn to travel, and then there is no guarantee that I will be allowed to travel, uh, that I will be given the permit to travel uh, by the Egyptian side. So traveling as a Palestinian is an article I wrote in 2014, which was published by the Journal of Biography, University of Hawaii. You can check it out. It's um, full of details of these struggles. And even getting here to the US, I, this is my second time here. I had to wait for one month, and I did two interviews, and I was placed under administrative processing, which means security check. And finally, I was given uh, a three-month visa, and there was a guy waiting for me once I got off, off the plane. So it's always like this. We are used to this. And uh, I, I, I know we shouldn't be used to this. It's, uh, it's not normal, but we have been going through this for so many years. Yeah, I have a question for me. Could you have a time now? OK. Uh, I posed this question to a Palestinian author, I mean, I'm sorry, to Israeli author, uh, Menachem Klein, last week. He was here in town talking about his book. And uh, basically, I asked him, you know, it was about one state, two state, and so on. And he said that if Israel is forced into a one state, it will definitely not be an egalitarian state. It will be an apartheid state. And they don't care. They have the means, the power, and the support to basically enforce, uh, enforce an apartheid system for decades to come. So my question to you is, are we ever likely to see a mindset or a narrative 
thinking among Israelis, uh, the Israeli society, who are now all in support of this criminal entity. I mean, there is no other way to describe it. Will we ever see a change in that? Well, I don't know. There's two parts of the question that I don't understand. One is the word if. What do you mean if Israel is, and what is, the, what do you mean by forced? And what do you mean by forced? All right. But if they don't, that's so this is this is this is this is indicative. This is indicative. This is characteristic of the Zionist hypocrisy. If Israel is forced and forced, who created the apartheid system? Who created a single state in Palestine? He didn't. Who created a single state in Palestine? What is this hypocrisy? If Israel established a single state, an apartheid state in Palestine, as soon as it was established by design. And then 20 years later, they took two parts of Palestine again, which Israel defined, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and finished the job. All of Palestine has been a single state, a single apartheid state, from the beginning because that's exactly what Israel wanted. This was not a mistake. This is not some act of, well, it happens still. Well, maybe it'll happen. Maybe What is this? This is such hypocrisy that it's, 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 it's beyond belief. If... And if it's forced, what do you mean forced? Who forced Israel to create a single, this apartheid regime? Who forced them to create a single state all over Palestine? Palestinians have been willing to talk about peace, about a two-state solution for decades. Israel stood in the way of doing this. So that's so typical. Now, is there a chance that Israeli society uh, point of view will change? Only the day after. Only the day after. The day after apartheid in Palestine falls and collapses. The day after. There's a call for a one person, one vote in all of Palestine, and the collapse of the Zionist regime, hopefully as a result of all of us wearing this, you know, acting, and BDS succeeding, then Israelis will wake up one morning and they'll realize the sky hasn't fallen. They may have a Palestinian prime minister, their kids are gonna go to school, Palestinian kids, and everything is gonna be fine. But the apartheid was, this, was, was established by Israel. So yes, I believe there is a chance, but it's not gonna come from, from heavens, it's only going to come if we act, and if we demand, and if we fight, and if we support the Palestinian struggle, and if we stop talking about this country using Zionist terms, and if we break away from, from, from the Zionist narrative and go back to calling the country Palestine and recognizing it's all occupied. And the fact that different Palestinians live under different sets of laws is part of the problem. So stop saying West Bank and Gaza, this, that, the other. It's all Palestine. It's all occupied. It's all, uh, all Palestinians have been subjected to these horrific crimes. And that should be the starting point of every conversation on Palestine. And the two-state solution is, is not, I can't believe people even have the nerve, have the audacity. But of course, you know, with Zionists and, and people like that, they have no threshold of, of, of shame. And so uh, they still talk about this. And again, I'm sure this will be the, 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 the main highlight of the J Street Conference, this wonderful you know, liberal aspect of Zionism that really does not exist other than when they have the J Street Conference. You know? So that's, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised he gave you that answer, by the way. But uh, I, it's certainly possible, but it's going to be possible only the day after they wake up and there's been a change that was forced upon them. <clears throat> is there any change in the in the uh, mainstream media? I mean, um, that you get the can get the interviews, or or do you see any any even the slightest change in the media? And also, my question to you, Yusuf, is wha uh, where else are you speaking, and uh, why you are here in the U.S.? Well, I haven't noticed any change in the mainstream media, so I. I, I I, I don't know that there is. I doubt that, you know, he should have been on CNN. <laughs> he should have been on all local, uh, you know, all, all the mainstream media uh, news outlets. And, and the, the work that he's done, the, 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 the writing that he's done, the research he's done on this issue, he should have been on all, on all the networks. But uh, I don't know that there's been a, a, a change in, in mainstream media at all. Not at all, not here. And by the way, it's, it's not only in the United States. It's the same thing in Britain. It's the same thing in Europe to get the mainstream media to report truthfully about Palestine is, is, is an impossible task right now. Yeah. Even in the Arab world? <laughs> in the Arab world. 
Yeah, they're no different than other countries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I was in New York, and uh, soon after this talk, I'm going to uh, Virginia, so DC, Virginia, and then uh, Portland, Oregon, and Hawaii. Yeah. And um, Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. Milwaukee and Hawaii. Uh, I will spend 10 days in Hawaii. <laughs> My name is Bob Griss. I'm a health policy researcher, and I'm curious if when Israel denies medical treatment to Palestinians, is there a, is there a, uh, an opportunity for Palestinians to request this medical treatment of other countries like the US or someplace in Europe? Or is there a UN affiliated organization that uh, would be appropriate to apply to uh, either for the medical treatment or to expose the kind of discrimination that Palestinians are experiencing as part of refugee rights um, yeah. Uh, so there are two ways to get medical treatment in, in Palestine. If you are in the West Bank, either you get treatment at a Palestinian hospital if it's available, or some Palestinians get referrals to go to Israeli hospitals, especially cancer patients, or traveling to Jordan. So in both cases, Palestinians are at the mercy of another country uh, to get treatment. And speaking of Gaza, it's the same. In Gaza, the, uh, the infrastructure like hospitals, and they, they need much equipment. So in most cases, and especially when it comes to cancer and chronic diseases, Palestinians get referrals to go to the West Bank. If they are uh, cancer patients, they go to Jerusalem. It's the only hospital where Palestinians go. Or some of them go to Israel. Again, they are at the mercy of Israel, and Israel uses you know, these permits to collectively punish Palestinians. It tells them either you collaborate against your people or you die in Gaza. So some people prefer to die, like most people prefer to die in Gaza. And the other way is to get to Egypt. And again, there is a permit. And Egypt denies people entry, entry sometimes, and they have to wait the long queues to get out of Gaza. And the UN doesn't play any role when it comes to denying Palestinians permits. My sister was an UNRWA teacher, and they did nothing to help her. And even after she passed away, I, I once uh, attended an interfaith dialogue meeting in Gaza that came from, I guess, part of it were from Virginia. Just, I think, two to three days before Israel launched its second major offensive on Gaza in 2012. And I asked the UNRWA official, why, what did you do to help an UNRWA employee who was denied a permit to receive medical attention? And he, and he said, I, I have to look into the case and find out why she was denied a permit. You know, all this nonsense to me as, as a refugee from Gaza. So th they do nothing to, to help Palestinians. And in many cases, Palestinians die waiting for payments in, in Gaza, and it's very common, especially cancer patients. Like every time and then every week, there's someone who passes away. Because, is, and sometimes Israel would grant them a permit two weeks after they pass away. Like I read some stories like that, of people saying, oh, my mother got a permit today, but she passed away two weeks ago. So yeah, this is a grim situation with patients. And then there's cost. Because let's say you do get the permit, Israel charges top dollars for Palestinians that it allows, that it gives treatment in its hospitals. In some cases, uh, in some cases the Palestinian Authority might uh, c cover uh, the expense, but it's an enormous expense, travel expense, hotel expense, the, the actual medical care, which is thousands and thousands and thousands, I'm told thousands of dollars. These, these the procedures are very, they, because they don't have, uh, you know, the Israel doesn't pro you know, provide health care first to Palestinians. And so uh, for free. So there's that issue as well. Let's say they could go to Britain. They have to buy a ticket. And you need somebody to go with the patient. 
I mean, we're talking about hurdles upon hurdles upon hurdles um, that really have no justification whatsoever. Is free health care available to Israelis? Though? Not free, but the Israel has pretty good health, you know, pre pretty good, um, pretty good health care uh, yeah, system. Yeah. Hi, uh, Phil Schreifer. I spent four years in Muslim countries. Uh, Miko, a, a question about a, a portion of the Israeli military. As I recall, maybe two years ago, there was a group of military folks, special forces, air, uh, pilots, and so on, who refused. They, they wanted to defend their country, but they refused to attack Gaza and places like that, and they'd organized. Are they still going, or, they, or I, haven't, I haven't heard anything about them in recent times? Yeah, th there are several groups, um, uh, several Israeli groups. Most of them have become NGOs, which is kind of problematic because it 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 um, it, uh, it, it it's forced them to get rid of their of their backbone. But they uh, they talk about you know they come up and talk about um, the crimes that they did, like breaking the silence. Um, and then you've got some refusers, uh, Israeli refusers that refuse, but they are, they are small and marginal. The only real opposition to serving in the military um, is, uh, comes from the ultra-Orthodox community. And they have, uh, you know, for the first you know, several decades, they were exempt. The army didn't want them, they didn't want the army, it was perfect arrangement. And then about 10 years ago, it became a hot political issue. Um, and so now every ultra-Orthodox boy or girl over the age of 16 is a deserter because they refuse to even show up for their first interview because they say, we will not serve in your army. And they suffer greatly. They suffer greatly. I mean, the Israeli police raid their neighborhoods, come at 2 o'clock in the morning, destroy the house, pull these kids by their beards like, uh, I don't want to say what. It's horrifying, the, th the things they go through, but they don't get any press. And in, that, in this case, we're, ta we're talking about enormous community. We're talking about ten, hundreds of thousands of people who are standing, and I believe there's a protest with something like 800,000 of them recently um, with big signs saying, we will not serve in your immoral army. Um, so that is, but they're not really a part of Israeli society. You know, they've never really accepted being a part of Israel, of Israel or Israeli society. Uh, but that's really the only place where there's that kind of resistance to that kind of uh, refusing. Because Israel does not recognize conscientious, uh, conscientious objectors. So. so in the interest of time, um, we will end it here. But thank you both, Yusuf and Miko. Thank you. As always, thank you so much for coming here. Yeah.